Next on Relevant Radio, your favorite weekly appointment. It's time for the Nazareth Project, faith, marriage, and family talk for the everyday Catholic with your host, Lydia Lococo. Good morning, Milwaukee. It is Friday, June 20th, and you have made it to the end of the week. Congratulations. You are listening to the Nazareth Project, faith, marriage, and family talk for the everyday Catholic. And by now, you probably know that Relevant Radio has expanded and we're simulcast on two stations, 100.1 FM and 1640 AM. We have a good, strong signal all across Milwaukee, the 10 counties of the Archdiocese. So we're so excited that you can hear us. And if you have a problem on either station, you can just switch to the other one. We air on Fridays at 9 a.m., but we re-air on Saturdays and Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., so you should be able to hear the Nazareth Project every single weekend. We're happy you're here. What we're going to look about today, we always are looking at the new evangelization through some prism, but we want to reiterate the idea that the new evangelization is not about any new gospel, right? It is a refocusing the faithful on the good news of Jesus, and it involves the renewal of faith and our willingness to share it. So if the church is the home of this new evangelization, then Catholic education is an instrument of it. It is the church which brings to our world an invitation to faith and an encounter with Jesus Christ. The church is his body on this earth, And it's tasked with the responsibility to hand on this rich deposit of faith to the next generation. I use in my mind the image of links in a chain. I think that Catholic schools have the capacity in a way that no other vehicle does to hand on the deposit of faith to the next generation. But we have to get our mission and identity right. And we have to have what Cardinal Whirl at the recent National Catholic Education Association's conference called, we have to have a bold new courage. We have to ensure that our Catholic education presents a real and authentic vision of what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. If you get the dignity of the human person then all of a sudden your world is transformed. You're not following rules, right? Social justice has meaning. Diversity has meaning. Sensitivity to other cultures has meaning. Carnal World shared that this authentic proclamation of Christ has to begin with a clear declaration of who he is. And only then will the faithful understand the importance of the church in their lives. We're just beginning the work of building the kingdom Perhaps each generation has to start this anew. I'm going to read to you a quote, which you're not supposed to do on the radio, but there are so many beautiful documents of the church, I have to. The document is called The Catholic School on the Threshold of the New Millennium. So bear with me. This is a great section number nine. Young people of the third millennium must be a source of energy and leadership in our church and nation. Therefore, we must provide young people with an academically rigorous and doctrinally sound program of education and faith formation designed to strengthen their union with Christ and his church. Catholic schools collaborate with parents and guardians in raising and forming their children as families struggle with the changing and challenging cultural and moral context in which they find themselves. Catholic schools provide young people with sound church teaching through a broad-based curriculum where faith and culture are intertwined in all area of a school's life. By equipping our young people with a sound education rooted in the gospel message, the person of Jesus Christ, and rich in the cherished traditions and the liturgical practices of our faith, we ensure that they have the foundation to live morally and uprightly In our complex modern world, this unique Catholic identity makes our Catholic elementary and secondary schools schools for the human person and allows them to fill a critical role in the future life of our church, our country, and our world. 
Now, this can all sound very overwhelming, doesn't it? I have to say that I myself get overwhelmed. And yet we have such courageous leaders. Our upcoming show that we taped in a studio previously was with Father John Belmonte from the Society of Jesus. He's a Jesuit. He might have known him when he lived in Milwaukee. He's now the superintendent of Catholic schools in Joliet, Illinois. And I'm really excited to share my discussion with him regarding how we can take Catholic schools into this new century and ensure that they will remain our best means of evangelization for we the are next here generation. with Father John Belmonte, who is a Jesuit and superintendent of Catholic schools in the Diocese of Joliet. Some of you might remember Father Belmo, as he's affectionately called, because he was the principal at the Jesuit College Prep High School in Milwaukee, Marquette University High School from 2004 until 2010. Right now, he is superintendent of Catholic schools for the Diocese of Joliet, and he's been there since 2010. Father Belmonte, I find it interesting that you are, I see in your bio, in 2013, you were elected to the NCEA. Mm -hmm. which stands for National Catholic Educators Association. National Catholic Educational Association, yep. Thank you. So I was you. elected to the superintendent's committee and also serve on the national board for the Catholic uh, National Catholic Educational Association. So um, great organization. And, uh, yeah, we serve Catholic schools around the country and uh, are, are presently going undergoing a reorganization of uh, NCA, which is very exciting. So it's a great privilege to be on the board. Well, before we get started, I want to give the rest of your bio, but I do want to ask you about that. Um, Father Belmonte has his undergraduate degree from Marquette University. And then he has a baccalaureate of, in sacred theology, magnu cum mm -hmm. laude from yep. the Gregorian, a licentiate from Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge. Now, there's a juxtaposition, but we don't have time for that. And <laughs> then you have a Ph.D. in educational leadership and policy studies from Loyola, which takes you to today you're a superintendent for Catholic schools. And right, which is why I tell the children <laughs> of the diocese here when I go to visit them that I completed the 27th grade, which is enough. <laughs> they to finally scare said you had to quit thinking. going to school, grade Father could, Belmo. Third grade could continue till 27th grade. It, uh, it scares them a little bit. I want to talk to Father John Belmonte because I'm very, very interested in Catholic education. And we're very interested, all of us, in mission and identity. And why I mentioned the NCEA is I hear they are writing up four new pillars. Can we start there? On Let's their, start there, sure. Then the first pillar is mission and identity. Is that correct? That is correct. Why don't you talk to us about the need for mission and identity in our Catholic schools? Well, you know, um, for those people out there who are familiar with Catholic schools and Catholic education over the last maybe 10 to 20 years, there's been a lot of discussion about Catholic identity at Catholic schools, how to um, increase your Catholic identity, how to um, enhance your Catholic identity, um, how do we measure that. And so there's been a lot of discussion about Catholic identity, which is all well and good. And some, um, you know, some schools uh, are particularly good at articulating their Catholic identity um, and, uh, you know, teachers supporting that and, and principals moving the Catholic identity of a school forward. One of the points that our bishop here in the Diocese of Joliet has made uh, in the past couple of years since he started as, uh, as bishop here is a good one that, uh, that I like. And he says we really have to move away from Catholic identity and toward Catholic school mission. It's good to talk about and think about our Catholic identity, but uh, much more important to really be about the mission of Catholic education, which, of course, is the salvation of souls and the souls of the children that uh, God sends us into our schools. And so I, I really have liked that, uh, that distinction that he made. 
uh, I think it's I think it's accurate. You know, talking about Catholic identity and understanding it is important, but we really have to get to our common mission um, as Catholic school educators, and you know, really embrace that and and move it forward. So, um, so that's what I think. Um, you know, organizations like the uh, National Catholic Educational Association do. Certainly, our diocesan offices uh, work very hard in those things. And the more we can be uh, clear that we're really focused on our Catholic school mission, uh, I think the better it's going to be not only for our schools, but especially for our children. So, Well, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is there a way that we could be focused on Catholic identity and not fulfill our mission? Yeah, I would say yes. You know, if it becomes a, a bit of sort of, um, you know, navel-gazing where you just sort of... Uh, talking about and thinking about Catholic identity all the time and, and really losing sight of the mission, yeah, I think it can be, you know, kind of a blind alley that you can end up in. And so that's why, you know, the the whole business of mission and Catholic school mission um, really leads us back to the school, leads us back to the students and, and what we're supposed to be about uh, as educators. Could I ask you, um, and this is a short interview, obviously, but what can parents look for just with a cursory glance at uh, your basic Catholic grade school? Are there some earmarks that somebody could say, wow, they are focused on the mission of the children, mm-hmm. you know, of our faith, of, of uh, growing these people and looking kind of at the whole child, you know, not just, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, that broad kind of education? What would be the earmarks? Yeah, well, when any, uh, I mean, in some ways, walking into any Catholic school, the culture of the school should be obvious to anyone who walks in that it is a Catholic school, not just in name only, and uh, and so that becomes part of the culture. And I like to compare it to sort of immersion schools uh, that you can run into with uh, with languages, French immersion school or Spanish immersion school. When you walk in, you hear the language of Spanish or French being spoken, and it's very obvious that it's immersion school. And I think the same thing should be true for our Catholic schools, that when we walk into them, uh, it's very clear to anyone who's uh, who's walking up and down the hallways and sitting in the classrooms that it's a Catholic school. So, um, you know, certainly um, the beautiful statues and uh, artwork, uh, which is part of our Catholic tradition, should be on display. And then um, the kinds of classroom discussions, the sorts of lessons, the kinds of prayers, mass, all of those things should be very evident to anyone who walks into the school. And so, you know, if you walk into a Catholic school and you can't tell the difference between it and uh, the public school down the street, then um, you should be looking for a different Catholic school. <laughs> right. Wow. And what do you do as superintendent? I mean, and not to be specific to necessarily your diocese, but where do we, I would say where do you personally, but where do we all start? I mean, so you're going to focus on mission. You sit down at your desk. Welcome to the rest of your life, Father John Belmonte. How do you start such a large, I mean, we're really asking how do we renew culture and then how do we follow our own mission? And I don't, Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's a large question, but are there some, you know, do you have a five-year kind of strategic plan for yourself and for your diocese? Yes. When I started, I inherited the uh, strategic plan that uh, now Archbishop Sarton of Seattle started. And so I've been working on that for the past five years. And, you know, clearly Catholic identity and Catholic school mission is uh, is central to all of that. And so it really should imbue everything that uh, that you do in the schools. And so, um, you know, we work very hard at developing Catholic culture. One of the things that I've done in the past four years here in the diocese is uh, initiate a devotional project across the diocese. So every Catholic school um, has had children uh, learning about and teaching about the Sacred Heart devotion. Last year we did devotion to the Blessed Mother, and then this year we've done devotions to the saints. And so, you know, really uh, this is something that uh, Cardinal Dolan said at a uh, at a Mass at uh, Marquette High School when I was principal that I've never forgotten. He said, the most important room in any school is not the science lab, it's not the gym, it's not the principal's office, the most important room in any school is the chapel or the church. That's where the most important lessons happen. Uh, that's where Christ is uh, is met in the sacraments, especially in, in the Blessed Sacrament. And that is the most important place in, in a school, our nun. And so I think that's where we have to start. We have to start with uh, with prayer. We have to start with our devotional life to uh, the Blessed Mother, to Jesus himself, and, uh, and then work out from there. And so we really emphasize those sorts of things in the diocese where, you know, we 
we have Mass uh, at least once a week uh, in every school in the diocese. We develop the devotional project uh, each year with our students, and then we've been focusing on our religion curriculum the last year as well. So all those things, I think, help to keep the focus on Catholic identity and mission. Now, when you were talking about, that's amazing, and I'm gasping for air, but when you were talking about Catholic mission and you were mm-hmm. talking about walking through the school, it occurred to me, and I, and I say this in all charity, that some young families must be very, frankly, overwhelmed because they might not have received the kind of formation to duplicate that same kind of culture in their own home. And they certainly need a lot of support. They certainly need a lot of help. I mean, it's just tough being a parent out there, much less a young young Catholic parent. And you have done something particularly interesting that we want to talk about, and it's called We Parent More. And it's an app. Am I correct? It's an app. That's right. That's a mobile app. Yep. Now, I know nothing about it, and neither does our audience, so tell us about We Parent More. Uh, I was noticing with some colleagues of mine here in the diocese that we really need to build a bridge for young parents into our parishes and into our schools, Uh, that often what happens is young people will come to uh, the church, they'll have their children baptized, and then often they kind of disappear. And sometimes they reappear to enroll in school, and sometimes they don't reappear at all. Uh, Sometimes they might uh, send their children to uh, religious education programs in the parish, and sometimes not. And so in talking with these colleagues, I thought, you know, we really one way to reach to reach out to these young parents, you know, 20 to 35 year old, you know, what sociologists call millennials, is to meet them where they are and where they are is on their smartphones. And so I thought, let's uh, create a mobile app, which would have all of the parenting resources, be a connection back to their parishes and their schools, and they can have it right on their smartphones. And so we founded a nonprofit organization and developed this app with some uh, sponsorship and some help from uh, from some friends. And so we have this app available to anyone free on the Internet. You can find it at uh, weparentmore.org, and you can upload it right to your home screen on an iPhone or an Android phone. Or if you want, what we really like to do is to register parishes and schools on the app so that those parishes and schools can put information about their, about, uh, their programs right on the app as well. So we've been going for about a year and a half, and we're in our 2.0 version version of the uh, of the app and uh, it's going re- very well. Wow, that's amazing. You're exactly right. That's exactly where they are, right? They're lo- they're looking down at the phone in their hand and that's such a great resource for them. I hope your friends keep supporting you because we need all kind of ideas out of the diocese of Juliet because you know you're feeding all of us. You may think you're isolated down there in Illinois, but we certainly um love looking at what you have and taking everything to our own schools and giving some thought and prayer to this. The parents take raising their children as you know very, very seriously. And they're very worried about it. And we get phone calls all the time about how they can um, go into that spirituality of parenting and um, pass on their faith and the deposit of faith to their children. Um, well, as I, you know, being a parent is uh, <laughs> the toughest and best job that anyone can have. And so uh, it's our role as, uh, as a church, it's our role as a diocese, as a Catholic schools office to help parents to be, you know, the best possible parents they can be and to raise their children in the faith. So um, anything we can do to, uh, to move that along is, uh, is going to be good for everyone and especially for, uh, for the church. So Absolutely. I want to tell our listeners, and we put these resources on our website, um, you're, you can follow Father John also because he's just a technological wizard. You can follow him on Twitter, and it's at Father underscore Belmonte, B E L M O N T E. If you go to the Diocese of Joliet.org, not only can you see many presentations and read his fabulous biography, which is compelling, but you can also at the very end of the, almost the very last sentence, what's, what do we find there, Father? A recipe. A recipe for my famous sanguinacho pudding. Uh, oh. it's a very rich, very good Italian uh, pudding made with uh, a lot of chocolate and dark chocolate and uh, <laughs> espresso. So, All right. Well, now I have something to hang over your head. You're going to have to make that for me. Happy to. Good. Anytime. Well, thank you so much for being our guest, for taking time out of your day and letting us interview you. You're a, you're a gift to the church and a dear friend, and we all miss you in Milwaukee, but we know you're doing good things in in Joliet. So thank you very well, thank much. Thank you very much, Lydia. Keep up the great work. All right. And uh, look forward to seeing you sometime soon up in Milwaukee. It's a deal. 
Thanks again to Father John Belmonte for joining me from Illinois this week in the studio. Details of my discussion with Father John can be found on our website, thenazarethproject.com. Going to take a quick break now, and you know what's next. Mailbag. We will dive right in. You are listening to The Nazareth Project on Relevant Radio. So what do you think? Did we make the right call or what? This backyard is incredible. We have our very own outdoor living space. The shrubs, plants, stone walkway, and I really love the water feature. So refreshing on these warm summer days. Honey, why did we wait so long to get this beautiful backyard? I'm so glad we brought in American Landscape. They can do it all, and they made it so effortless. If you can picture it, American Landscape can make it happen. You can rest assured that the haven you have in mind can happen with American Landscape. Transform an ordinary yard into an outdoor living space everyone will love. Since 1973, American Landscape has been serving residential and commercial property owners with certified professionals. Go to RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. A proud supporter of Relevant Radio. We're back with the Nazareth Project on Relevant Radio. Here's your host, Lydia Lococo. Welcome. This is my favorite part of the show, in case you've never listened before. This is the mailbag when people call in or write in with various questions, things they want to ask. You can call 414-758-2241, and you'll get a dedicated line with no one at the other end. It's just recording you. You can leave your first name and parish, or you can just put anonymous. We'd love to have your question. Or you can write Nazareth Project at archmill.org and email me questions. We play the recorded questions, and I'll read your questions out loud. And you'll be a big help for the other listeners on the show. So here we go. Hi, Lydia. This is Therese from St. John the Evangelist Parish in Greenfield, Wisconsin. We're almost at summertime, and I am just wondering, I know you have eight kids. I'm just looking for some creative ideas for my own four to keep them busy during the summer because there are just too many temptations with computers and video games and TV So I'm looking for some creative ideas for something I can do with them. Appreciate the help. Thanks. God bless. Thanks, Therese, for the question. That is on everyone's mind right now. Every mother across the Archdiocese of Milwaukee is having the same thoughts you are. So thanks for the question. You know, I went on the Internet quickly, as all of you can do, and you can type in fun things to do with your kids this summer. And a plethora of information will be at your fingertips. And so you can read things like bake cookies for ice cream sandwiches and volunteer at the Nature Center, make a family yearbook, have a luau in the backyard, visit the beach and collect shells. Now, Therese, I'm just going to tell you the answer. No one is listening, so I'll share my innermost thoughts with you. I'm a big believer in the philosophy of benign neglect. I threw my kids out in the backyard, and I I don't think I had a luau for them. However, I kid about it, but I think we are all thinking about a deeper question, which you alluded to, which is, I want to be deliberate about my summer. I take mothering seriously. I don't want to entertain my kids. I don't want to be the camp clown. But on the other hand, I really am afraid about that screen time. It's just so tempting on a long day with a lot of kids. And I want to be intentional about my mothering. And that's what should be applauded. Good for you. Good for all of us for taking our vocation seriously. I would share that I think it's important to have goals as a mother, as a parent, for the summer, to have goals for your children. And the goal is, my one little goal that I'm going to pray about for this summer is, I'm going to be deliberate in my mothering, in my caretaking this summer. So you might have different goals than I have, but our goal together would be to think about this and to pray about it. Um, One thing that I think might be on everyone's list, although ours might differ, would be we want our children to read during the summer, right? However you do that, if you have a book list, if you enroll them at the library and they have a list, if they do it with the neighborhood kids, but we want them to read, we do want to limit screen time. It eats away at their childhood. You don't get as much productive impact from the time in front of the screen as you do really doing anything else. 
So that would be a goal also. I like to always say I'd like to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament with my kids or a pilgrimage during the summer, maybe one or two pilgrimages, maybe a visit every other day or every day. I was trying to think of the churches that have perpetual adoration. I know St. Mary's in Elm Grove does, St. Jerome's in Oconomowoc does, St. John the Evangelist in Greenfield does, so that's your parish. So that what might be a goal, right? We all have different goals, and again, I would love to hear from our listeners And one of my uh, last goals that I just share with you as an idea to throw out there besides reading, making a visit, limiting screen time, encourage boredom in your children. Throw them out in the backyard and say, go figure it out. Some of the best times my kids had as they were growing up were the games they invented, staring at the sky, I don't know, throwing balls. They still talk about something called egg ball. I still don't know what that means. I don't I don't know what game that alludes to, but it was a game created with the eight Lococos and the five Brigmans across the street. So I would just say encourage and empower your own child to learn how to self-feed and to self-entertain, for lack of a better word, and then make a few intentional, specific, concrete goals for yourself during the summer and be deliberate about your summer. And then if you want to do things like have a luau in the backyard, you go to that internet. There are lots of ideas. Thanks so much, Therese. And um, thanks for your question. That's it for questions. We'll be right back. So what do you think? Did we make the right call or what? This backyard is incredible. We have our very own outdoor living space. The shrubs, plants, stone walkway, and I really love the water feature. So refreshing on these warm summer days. Honey, why did we wait so long to get this beautiful backyard? I'm so glad we brought in American Landscape. They can do it all, and they made it so effortless. If you can picture it, American Landscape can make it happen. You can rest assured that the haven you have in mind can happen with American Landscape. Transform an ordinary yard into an outdoor living space everyone will love. Since 1973, American Landscape has been serving residential and commercial property owners with certified professionals. Go to RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. A proud supporter of Relevant Radio. We are back with the Nazareth Project on Relevant Radio and your host... Lydia Lococo. And now what really matters. I read an article last week in a secular publication, and it had a starting first line. The line was, a legacy can be lost. I think what is unique to the Catholic experience in the United States at this specific point in the economy of salvation is that we deeply understand this to be true. We certainly see it all around us, and at the same time, we see new shoots of growth and a new fire of the Holy Spirit in some of our young people. I think it's an odd experience to see the irrelevance of faith on the part of society that we now are calling the nuns, those one in five Americans who check none when asked about their faith affiliation, to juxtapose those nuns with the new emergence of what I can only call people who are filled with the urgency of the gospel those people who are hungry and who are themselves on fire. It's important to understand when we think of Catholic education that what we have, this deposit of truth, this doctrine of belief to be passed on from generation to generation, that is not only worth passing on, but that it's something worth living and dying for. It is, in the end, all that really matters. This has been the Nazareth Project, faith, marriage, and family talk for the everyday Catholic. Relevant Radio has expanded, and we're now simulcast on two stations, 100.1 FM and 1640 AM. You can find the Nazareth Project Friday mornings, every Friday at 9 AM. We re-air Saturdays and Sundays at 9 AM. But in the meantime, stay in touch with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter. We're called Nazareth Project on both. And remember that we need you for our mailbag. Anything goes. Send us your questions about faith, marriage, family, relationships, work by calling our dedicated voicemail, 414-758-2241, or just email me at nazarethproject at archmail.org. 
Today's show and our past shows are available online at thenazarethproject.com, and you'll find there lots of other resources and information. Coming up next week, I'm so excited to share with you Barbara Lyons, Executive Director of Wisconsin Right to Life. Thank you for chatting this morning. I'm Lydia Lococo, and we'll see you next Friday for The Nazareth Project on Relevant Radio. God bless your day. You've been listening to The Nazareth Project on Relevant Radio. Tune in next Friday morning at 9 for more faith, marriage, and family talk with Lydia. And for more information about today's guests and topics, visit thenazarethproject.com.